Peace, my devoted viewers. Today, I will be conducting a sermon directly from Notre Dame about one of the most famous attacks on the corruption of the church back in the olden days. In 1881, Victor Hugo wrote a novel called The Hunchback of Notre Dame, the tale of a gypsy named Esmeralda who comes to Paris when everyone seems to be going through a rather bad case of xenophobia. But thankfully, the captain of the guards Phoebus, a timid poet named Gringoire, and of course, a hunchback bell ringer named Quasimodo, take a liking to her, and after some initial resentment, she takes a liking to them too. But the ultra-conservative religious fanatic minister Claude Frollo soon gets more objectifying hots for her, and a combination of her disinterest in him and fear that his lust for her might lead to his damnation results in him deciding that she's literally got to go to hell. Can Quasimodo save her in time? In the book, no, but in many film adaptations, yes, including the one from Disney. I mean, it's an animated Disney film, so that's just going to be one of the numerous things from the original story that's toned down. Right? Well, for those who don't know, Disney actually did not sugarcoat the story as much as you'd think. Sure, this is probably the loosest adaptation of Hugo's novel ever, with a more comedic edge, bright colors, and only the very basic plot of the original story. But there are actually many themes that are not only kept intact, but made possibly even darker. The film does not shy away from showing how hateful and ungodlike those who interpret the Bible too literally can be, with Frollo still feeling the need to kill those that inspire lust, supposedly aren't born in God's own image, or aren't even from his hometown. But it's true that the more lighthearted direction does take the story in a somewhat different direction than most adaptations. This isn't bad, not to me at least, but I think it makes it worth comparing to another somewhat closer adaptation. Only problem is, there's just so many, it's hard to find the right one to compare it to. But I ultimately decided on the 1939 film because it seemed to have a strong influence on the Disney film, not just in the designs of the characters, but also in certain story elements, like having Frollo be a super conservative judge instead of a minister, and keeping the main characters alive in the end. I thought that would make it the easiest one to compare, but that's still not saying too much. And just remember two things. One, none of this is fact, it's only my own personal opinions. Second, I'm comparing the two based on which one I find artistically better, not necessarily how faithful to the source material it is. So let's sneak past the guard so I can deliver the sermon of a critique for you all. This is Old vs. New, The Hunchback of Notre Dame. Okay, so there's actually a couple more things to note. One, there's not going to be a best story round. Not a direct one, anyway. Seeing how the stories of both films are so heavily character-driven, there's really no point in devoting a whole round to it because it would mainly just be rehashing comparisons from the other ones. So keep in mind, each character round is also going to be taking into account the story and how its depiction of the character influences it. Because of this, I think we should have our title character Quasimodo be the final round here instead. So let's start with the romantic and resistance lead in the story, the best Esmeralda. No story dealing with an oppressed and tortured society would be complete without a rebel against the oppressors, and ours just happens to also be the love interest of the main characters in the story, Esmeralda, played by Maureen O'Hara and Demi Moore. Now this one was tough, because both fill this role pretty well. Both are very stealthy and evasive with their enemies unless the plot demands otherwise, both effectively convey the character's pain of being misunderstood by society, and each have moments in the story where they have to save the lives or at least the dignity, of the male characters instead of having them save hers. Their personalities, on the other hand, couldn't be any more different. The original Esmeralda is a golden-hearted gal who fights for her cause by seeking the good in people's hearts and trying to appeal to it. But she also knows when there is none and they just need to be told they suck ass. She's quite the sweetheart and a very likable character overall. 
Disney's Esmeralda is very kind too, but only towards the people she feels really deserve it, which to her are the other oppressed folks and those who make a genuine effort to earn her respect. But to everyone else, she's just a cynical smartass whose method of civil disobedience is kung fu, so I guess it depends on whether you believe in peace or assertiveness when dealing with the politically incorrect. For me personally, I enjoy the 96 Esmeralda a little more. While I usually am one for peace and harmony, treating someone like an outcast because they're different from you is a really hot issue for me. And I think it's good for those who have experienced discrimination to have a role model who can stand up for themselves and say, I'm not going to take that crap from you. And let's be honest, if you lived the kind of life she led, you probably would be a more world-weary freedom fighter. You probably would be more skeptical with those you offered kindness to. But thankfully, she never reaches the point where she comes off as unlikable. The cynic attitude she offers is funny as hell, and when she is nice, she really is nice. And while I like the 39 Esmeralda overall, there are a few big problems I have with her. One is her relationship with Quasimodo. When she first meets him, she runs away in fear from him just like everyone else. Yeah, for someone who's been so vocal about being misunderstood and rejected, she sure is pretty misunderstanding and rejecting towards the poor guy. Even when she does learn to accept him, it still leaves something to be desired. I know the idea is that she only likes Quasimodo as a friend, but even that bond doesn't feel all that meaningful in this version. Sure, the Disney version only thought of Quasi as a friend as well, but they still had some pretty good chemistry with one another. The moment she met Quasimodo, she could immediately relate to the pain he was going through and reached out to him, leading to some charming interactions between the two throughout the film. Even when she chooses Phoebus even after Quasi saved her life, she still shows her gratitude and affection towards him, making it clear that they've still got a good bond that we'll see once again in a crappy straight-to-video sequel. The 1939 one just rides off with her lover with no goodbye or thank you to the poor guy whatsoever. What gratitude. And second, this line. They tell me gypsies are a lot of thieves. That's not true, Your Majesty. Whenever we steal, it's because we're hungry. Uh, I'm sorry, but being hungry doesn't make stealing okay. I don't care what Les Miserables says. Just a nitpick, really, but it still bothered me. While both versions are generally likable and have their own effective ways of fighting oppression, the Disney one is just more confident, more believable, and more consistent with her beliefs. And that gets my vote. Point goes to the new. You mustn't talk like that in here. It sure does suck that old Quasi didn't win over Ezzy Girl in the end, huh? So they would have had to make the other guy really awesome to justify that kind of ending, wouldn't they? So let's look at which film did it better with Best Other Love Interest. Now this one is a bit interesting. In the original story and most adaptations, including the 39 film, Esmeralda actually had two other lovers besides Quasimodo. Well, true lovers anyway. One was Phoebus, the captain of the guards, and the other was Gringoire, a drifter poet. The Disney version, on the other hand, merged the two characters into one, probably for the sake of simplicity. So is two better than one, or does Disney's Phoebus have enough charm to outweigh his opponents despite being outmatched? Well, it really depends on which one you compare him to. If you compare him only to the original Phoebus, then Disney wins. No contest. The 30s version is just the bland, heroic stereotype with no personality that we often see in old movies, while the Disney version is a chill, funny, wise guy. But against Gringoire, it's a different case. Sure, he's a lot more meek and humble compared to Phoebus, but he has a lot more time to develop his character, and that's really a huge advantage in the long run. Even though he's a bit of a pansy at first, he really is a charming and likable guy, and eventually finds enough self-confidence to be a true hero that we really want to root for. Like trying to help Quasimodo when he's being whipped before Esmeralda beats him to it, and defending Esmeralda when she's on trial. Don't get me wrong, Captain Phoebus is a fun character, and he does have a few moments to shine in the story, but his character isn't quite fleshed out enough for my liking, nor is his relationship with Esmeralda. 
Again, much more time is given in the original for the two to have solid chemistry with one another, so it seems a lot more believable and honestly kinda cute. Sure doesn't justify Esmeralda riding off with him with no thanks or goodbye to Quasimodo, but I can see why she would choose this guy over him. But in the Disney film, they never really felt like they had enough time to form a true connection. They start out pretty much hating each other, then are neutral five minutes later, and then in the next scene where the two of them are together, they decide they're in love. Somewhat contrived, ain't it? Sort of a toss-up, but Gringoire is the more prominent of the two characters Disney's Phoebus is based off of, and seeing how I like Gringoire more, I think the original gets the point on this one. Point goes to the old. It's hitting a little below the belt, don't you think? And now for the one you all want to talk about, the self-proclaimed Christian that uses God's word to justify persecution and murder that we've all come to know and hate himself. This is the best Frollo. <laughs> Unlike the other rounds, this one is pretty easy to pick out. Disney's interpretation of Claude Frollo is considered one of the best Disney villains ever. He's violent, ruthless, manipulative, he considers anyone different from himself sinful and unholy, and he's got the voice of the incredibly talented Tony J. This version was, is, and always will be the best interpretation of the character in my eyes. But it's not to say that there haven't been a lot of other good ones in adaptation history. Hell, even the one from the Wishbone version is pretty despicable. But it saddens me to say that Cedric Hardwick's portrayal in the 1939 film is a bit of a lightweight. It's not horrible or anything, he's definitely got the xenophobia down and the resentment towards Esmeralda for giving him lustful urges. That is no crime I would not permit to free myself of. But there's a few too many scenes showing his vulnerability, and he just doesn't come off as a natural menace. Tony J's Frollo was a mighty force of hatred and cruelty that would have you on your knees begging for mercy if you pissed him off. This Frollo tries to come off that way, but it always feels like an act. It doesn't help that arguably his most evil deed in the whole story, namely killing Quasimodo's mother and almost drowning Quasimodo as a baby, is never shown in this version. In most versions, that's the first thing we see this bastard do, and it immediately makes us love to hate the guy with an utter passion. Don't get me wrong, the 39 one does have his diabolical moments in the film. Like he manipulates Quasimodo into stalking Esmeralda when she won't take him for a boyfriend. He has his guards destroy the new printing press so Gringoire can't type out an appeal for Esmeralda. And he has Esmeralda tortured pretty violently to get her to falsely confess to killing Phoebus. But do you notice a recurring theme here? He has other people do his dirty work for him, but he almost never directly does any of it himself, other than killing Phoebus and attacking Quasimodo in the climax. And even those don't work too well, since we don't actually see him stabbing Phoebus on screen, and when he does go against old Quasi, he gets defeated so quickly it's almost embarrassing. Disney's Frollo still had others do his evil bidding as well, but he would personally do evil himself just as often, and he does not go down easily at all in his final confrontation against Quasimodo. I know I'm probably being a bit hard on Cedric Hardwick, and it is a pretty tough competition he's going up against, but his interpretation of Claude Frollo was a little too underwhelming for my liking. The Disney version was a hammy but completely ruthless bigot with a possibly even more twisted view on the word of God than Olivia Foxworth or Margaret White. And he shall smite the wicked and plunge them into the fiery pit. And his awesome villain song Hellfire seals the deal with him getting the point on this round. Point goes to the new. May God have mercy on your soul. <laughs> But you can't fight against an oppressive system all by yourself, or start an oppressive system for that matter. So let's see who is more helpful to our heroes and villain with Best Supporting Cast.
Let me start off by making something clear. I don't hate the Gargoyles personally like a lot of people do. They're not the best comic relief characters in Disney history, but I giggled at a few of their jokes and they were well acted. But what I do hate about them is that they take time away from the more important side characters of the story, especially the Archbishop. The one in the original had a fairly big role as a kind old grandfatherly figure to the main characters of the story, ready to give them emotional support whenever they needed it. Sure, he probably should have told the king that his evil brother Frollo killed Phoebus instead of trying to protect him, but hey, they're family, and he's such a sweet guy, it's pretty easy to forgive him. The Disney one is only in a few scenes, and whenever he is on screen, he usually seems angry and bitter. Although that may be because he primarily interacts with Frollo here, and who wouldn't treat him like that? And they're not brothers here either. Nonetheless, he isn't able to leave the gentle impression of the original bishop with the screen time that he does have. How about the eccentric gypsy leader Clopin? Both versions do well as a comic relief character, not hesitating for a second to hang anyone he considers an enemy, but as the nicest guy on earth towards those he knows are friends, kind of like Esmeralda in the new film. But I think I like the 30s Clopin a little better, because he feels like he has more of a purpose than just laughs. Granted, the Disney version still has a decent amount of screen time, at least compared to the Archbishop, but his purpose here seems to be primarily comic relief and some exposition at the beginning, and not much else. The 39 film gives us a better look at his pain from the persecution against him and the other gypsies, and he seems more supportive towards Esmeralda, trying to defend her at trial and help protect her against the attack on the church in the climax, even dying while doing so. The new one looks like he's going to do that, but we never see him do a single thing, again because the gargoyles hog all the screen time fighting off the enemies. The King of France isn't in the animated film, but he was never that big of a character anyway, so it's not a huge loss. Plus, he has probably the worst possible system of determining whether people are guilty or innocent of a crime. Is this the dagger found in our hand? Here is my dagger. If you touch yours, you will be judged guilty. If you touch mine, you will be innocent. Blindfold her. I know this is said in the 15th century, but come on, what scientific method could possibly justify that as a valid means of verifying the guilt or innocence of a suspect? Anyway, I also feel like the background characters help portray the conflict of the story better in the original. The guards and the peasants do really well at portraying 15th century Paris as this hateful and discriminatory society that doesn't even know the meaning of the term politically correct, while the gypsies are portrayed as this ragged, oppressed society trying desperately to fight for their rights and take down anyone who stands in their way. We get a decent amount of that in the Disney film, but not quite enough to get that feeling of conflict and tension that could have been achieved, thanks again to our friends the Gargoyles. Again, they're fun characters, but they're not the ones who should have all that screen time, and this keeps the more important side characters from being as developed or likable as they should. The original gives them the focus and screen time they need, and they end up being characters that we want to root for, or hate, much more. Point goes to the old. Don't act rashly, my child. <laughs> and now for the big deciding point to break the tie. The titular lovable hunchback himself, the best Quasimodo. One thing I love about these two interpretations of Quasimodo is that each one is very similar to two of my favorite female characters in media. Charles Lawton in the original plays the character like Eleven from Stranger Things Season 1, where he starts out barely able to speak or fully understand what's going on around him, but when others show him true kindness for the first time, he becomes more open and social. Hell, if they had kept the whole bad guy killed his mom as a baby aspect of the story, I might wonder if this guy was Eleven's ancestor. The Disney version, voiced by Tom Holtz, is more similar to Carrie White, where the character is more educated and speaks a lot more, but has been raised raised with the mindset that the world outside of his home in the bell tower is an evil and dangerous place that he should have no part of. But once others show him love, like in the original, he learns that life has some awesome parts as well, and he joins in the fight against the oppression of Notre Dame caused by Frollo. So we have a quiet, barely self-aware guy that becomes more social and less violent, and a socially awkward guy that becomes more self-confident and badass. 
So which one do you find yourself supporting and feeling for more? Well, one important thing about quiet or mute characters is that they have to be extremely expressive to properly emote for the audience. But the 39 Quasimodo always seems to have the same blank expression throughout the whole movie, so without much dialogue, it's really hard to tell what the character's thinking or feeling. So scenes like him being crowned the King of Fools or being publicly whipped aren't as emotionally powerful for the audience. It's not really Charles Lawton's fault, it's mainly because the makeup he wears for the role is so thick, it's almost impossible to express through. And sure, this has been a bit of a problem for other versions that are closer to the book as well, but the makeup they wear usually isn't quite as thick, so they are able to be more expressive. Where's Lon Chaney? Nah, wacko, Lon Chaney was still a bad facial actor even without much makeup. See you in old versus new Animaniacs in a couple months. The animated version was drawn by Disney animators, so naturally his facial acting is absolutely astounding. Even if this guy had no dialogue, you still probably would be able to know what he was thinking because he was just that expressive. So did giving him a lot of dialogue waste a golden opportunity? Eh, maybe a little, but Tom Hulse's vocal performance just brings so much heart to the character that just makes you want to root for him all the more. And don't get me wrong, the original Quasimodo does have some awesome moments in the film. Like, it's pretty cool when he just barges into the courtroom and boldly tries to take the fall for killing Phoebus to save Esmeralda. It wasn't her! You want to know who it was? It was me. There is no fear or hesitancy in him at all. He is going to save this girl. Him rescuing Esmeralda from death is also pretty awesome, and sometimes the character's gesturing is able to convey a good amount of emotion. But it still doesn't quite make up for his overall lack of dialogue and facial expressions in the movie, and we just can't tell what he's thinking or feeling enough to form a strong emotional connection with him. Disney's version just had more screen time, very powerful facial expressions, and a lot of ambitions that were conveyed clearly on screen, making him the character we want to root for more. Point goes to the new, which means the new is our final winner. Why was I not made of stone like thee? Ooh!